In the city of La Puente on First Street sits an odd-shaped building, abandoned. In the late 1940s, this theater saw the resurgence and healing of America. It survived the generational strife of the 60s and transformed with the more liberal and open-mindedness of the 70s. But in the 90s, it saw the loss of public interest involving the preservation of historical structures in the valley and surrounding areas. The Puente slash Star Theater. True, the theater has seen better days. Along with its celebrated Art Deco design, this structure also brings memories of a past era. Saturday matinees, double features, double dates. We learned about life, culture, politics, romance, and yes, even sex there. Hi, I'm Marty Shields, and behind me stands an historic and iconic building. Along with being of significance to LA County's architectural history, it has a special connection that is deeply rooted to this city. Its days may be numbered. Join us as we look at a master architect's visionary building style and its cultural importance to the city. Dim the lights and fire up the projector and peer into the magic of our valley's first walk-in movie theaters. Get in line for the first picture show. Here, another forgotten tale of the Rancho La Puente. Let's rewind the reel back to the beginning, the early 1900s. The first Nickelodeons, kinescope parlors, flicker shows, movie houses and walk-ins all played an important vital part of our society's experience of watching a movie together. Before television, movies transported patrons from their everyday lives into a fantasy world of escapism, an adventure, Romance. Musical. Comedy. Horror or science fiction movie, only blocks away. To help on this episode, We'll need some expert insight and knowledge about this area's theaters. My name's Harold Taylor, and I uh, worked in theaters. Actually, when I was in college, I was going to Mount San Antonio College, and I had applied to several theaters in the area to get a job to try to help pay my way through college, and uh, uh, got turned down. Uh, I, I, I know I put an application at the Village Theater in, in Claremont, which it doesn't exist anymore. They turned me down. And I went to the Eastland and put an application, and the manager called me in and interviewed me and hired me. So I was 18 years old, and I started as an usher. And back then, an usher really ushered. They actually showed people their seat with a flashlight and uh, helped people, you know, were there all the time. In fact, we used to have to stand at the head of the aisle with our flashlights in front of us and show people to their seats. And it was, I mean, honestly, I felt like a real real special person that I got a job in a theater. It was the best job there was around. And I would go up at school the next day and say, oh, I'm working at the Eastland. You work at the Eastland? You know, it's like, it was a real prestige job, you know. But most theaters, I think, were in those days. Uh, during that time, during that 35 years, I did everything. I was projectionist for a while. I was usher. I was assistant manager. I was relief manager. I was district manager. <laughs> I did just about everything there was to do in, in theaters. As the movie industry grew, theaters were being designed and built primarily for movies. The first movies were shown in tents like this one. When the Electric Theater's actual building was built in 1902, it became Los Angeles' first permanent movie house. And it promptly changed its name to the Lyric Theater in 1906. In 1909, the first movie theater locally was over the Pony Hills in the former Quaker settlement of Whittier. The Family Theater showed one reelers, a 10 minute movie on one reel, along with presenting vaudevillian acts, still on a regular basis. 
In 1910, Whittier saw the Optic open its doors. And on this side of the hills, we saw our first and second theaters built in Covina in 1911. The Empress Theater and the Isis and later to be renamed Star Theater. Back in Whittier for the Barry Grand Theater in July of 1913. In 1916, all three Watkins in Whittier closed their doors, but were replaced that same year by the Gale Theater. 1920 brings an important movie house to Whittier, the Scenic, later to be renamed the Roxy in 1929. This theater stays open until 1968. In 1921, we're back in Cabina for the opening of a theater that would stay open until 2005. The Cabina Theater in downtown Cabina was spacious for its time. The movie house had a balcony and sat 499 patrons. So the Cabina had a, what they call a cry room. And it was first, well, I think it was smoking too, but I'm not sure. Um, but if you had a baby that was fussing, and crying, you went into this room that had speakers that carried the sound and an all glass front and a, two or three rows of seats. And you sat in there and closed the door and you could watch the film without disturbing people in the audience. In 1922, the Strand Theater is built in Whittier. And for the first time, it uses advancements in theater design to improve the movie going experience for the public. In the first 10 years of walk-in theater construction, design concepts were radically changing. Owners came to the realization that the look and feel of the theater contributed to its success. Enter S. Charles Lee. Originally from Chicago, this Navy veteran was an inquisitive teenager. He grew up with the ever-evolving motion picture. He went to vaudeville and early movie houses. He attends college and begins to look at theater design as an art form. He arrives in California in 1922. Initially, Lee focuses on designing some of Los Angeles' most iconic buildings. His first theater design was the Tower Theater in 1927. It was considered the finest thousand-seat theater in all of America. Within five years, Lee was becoming something of a celebrity. His buildings became prototypes for the whole country. S. Charles Lee was famous for having etched glass uh, uh, murals in his, uh, the, the best one of all was the Academy Theater, where this glass uh, etching is, faces you as you walk into the theater. Just beautiful stuff that, that they don't do anymore, you know, it's just not, I guess it's just not considered chic or whatever, but. It's early December of 1928, outside a building that Lee built for the Motion Picture Producers Association. He is seen here with Norma Shearer, actress and wife of famed film producer Irving Thalberg. Locally, the McNeese Theater opens in Whittier in 1929, and by 1934, it changes its name to the Bruins Whittier Theater. Whittier Theater was a, and I did go there many times as a kid, and I was more fascinated with the, uh, the stars on the ceiling and the moving clouds that used to slowly go across the ceiling than I was in the movie. I'd sit there the whole time looking up the ceiling and watching the cloud. It fascinated me. It was built, that's called an atmospheric theater. It creates an atmosphere inside. And it was built like a Mexican hacienda all around the side walls. You'd see little doors and windows and backlit stuff. And you always wonder, I wonder who lives up there or I wonder who's in there. And it was all, it was all illusion. But it really gave you the feeling that you were really in a special atmosphere. Or you were outdoors, you know, watching the movie under the stars. The year 1939 brings several seminal moments in our Valley's theater history. The last theater in Whittier to be built in 25 years opens, the Wardman. And S. Charles Lee ventures out of Los Angeles and into the wilderness of the San Gabriel Valley. The city of El Monte sees two theaters open in 1939. A.L. Sanborn's The El Monte Theater and the S. Charles Lee Tumbleweed Theater. Very western looking barn. It had a windmill out front where the marquee was. 
And if you drove by it, you'd really believe it was just a barn sitting out there. You'd go inside and it was all open beam ceiling. The light fixtures were lanterns, old, you know, they had been converted to electrical. A, a strange thing, a strange design, really, if you look at it, but uh, for many years it was very successful. And it looked cool. His Art Deco style designs many theaters in California. In 1940, the Alex Theater in Glendale. And here, the iconic spire on the Tower Theater in Fresno. When they met, the way they smiled. With the outbreak of World War II in 1941, all theater construction building materials are put on hold. And so is Lee. It's a different world in 1946, when Lee again begins to design theaters in California. Grand theaters have become a thing of the past. He becomes the first architect to respond to the impact of the automobile. The show now begins on the sidewalk, as theaters are fashioned as striking advertisements. Lee's new building style shifts to a modern streamlined design. America now being enamored with flight and speed. He loved the industrial look, the modern look, brought on by the space, uh, by jet aircraft and stuff like that. So you see the design of most of his buildings have a lot of sweeping, you know, marquees. The main thing was the marquee. He was another one that believed that the show should start on the sidewalk out front, you know, because you were impressed, you go out and drive by and say, oh, look at that, you know, look at the neon. And look at, that was all part of the, of the presentation, the show business. A prime example of this post-war shift is the Puente Theater. This domed Quonset hut structure is an exceedingly rare style. Los Angeles Conservancy, 1947. So it was the cheapest, easiest way to, to put a theater up in a short amount of time. And yet it was very efficiently designed. And uh, the Quonset hut design was a great design too. For Puente in 1947, this was big especially for a small bedroom community. Up until then, only larger cities had movie houses within their borders. During the war, theaters were located on city streets, side by side, either between a malt shop and a candy store or, or retail of some kind. And there would be uh, all on one main street downtown. If people would get ready to go to the movies, they'd go to downtown. That was where the theaters were. As time went on and everybody went out into the suburbs, the theaters also went out in the suburbs. Lee's design was unusual for a theater. A curved ceiling improved the movie's sound and kept the heating and cooling costs down. Lee begins to implement his own construction of a tilt-up building system, a cost-effective design to create cement pillars, arches, and frames. His building system technique would be recognized and published in 1952 in the architectural record. The Puente Theater opens its doors in late 1947. It has a ticket booth, small snack bar and lobby, and seats 499 patrons. Upstairs consists of a projection booth and owner's office. The first movie shown was Pinocchio. Between the years of 1948 and 50, Lee continues to use his Quonset Hut design with the Harper, Colorado, and Garmar theaters. He also includes two crying rooms at the Garmar. The early 1960s continue with additional Sanborn theaters now being built in the valley. Founder A.L. Sanborn's 60-year-old theater company was now being run by his innovative son, Arthur Sanborn. Like S. Charles Lee, Art Sanborn's ideas with design and construction were only matched by his business sense and presentation of theaters. In West Covina, the Eastland Theater. Art Sanborn. He's the, he's the one who brought in, uh, built in 61, built that theater, which was really against uh, the 
opinion at that time, everybody said that's foolish to build a new theater in 61 because, you know, television was taking over everything and theaters were going down, they were closing left and right. He built the first what they call shopping center theater, and that was the Eastland. And the shopping center means that it was a standalone building with parking all around it. So just like a shopping center, you go to a J.C. Penney, you park out in the parking lot. Presenting as our guest uh, artist was uh, Jane Mansfield. She opened the Eastland Theater in 1961 with art on stage. We had the West Covina Junior Band was there playing, and we had searchlights, we had the whole bit. By the way, the Eastland Theater's opening feature was the Comancheros with John Wayne. I, I wish we could have gotten John Wayne there. That would have been nice. <laughs> and with a little less fanfare, the Capri Theater opens in 1962. And I went to the opening night of the Capri, and Jesse White was the celebrity, the comedian Jesse White was the celebrity that opened the Capri Theater, and they showed Bye Bye Birdie, that was their opening feature. The Whitwood opens up in 64, and in Rowan Heights, Flax Fifth Avenue opens in 1968. The theater's namesake, Fifth Avenue, would soon become Clema Road. In 1969, the West Cove and Covina's Fox Theater opens up with multiple screens each. I believe the West Cove was the first, there's an argument about this, it was the first multi-screen theater, multiple screen theater in San Gabriel Valley, but I, I don't know for sure if that's true or not. Um, uh, but we always, we always believed we were anyway. Some theaters remodel and expand to multi-screens. Left now are only some of the single screen theaters, like El Monte's Tumbleweed and Whittier's Roxy, which both closed down in 1971. In fact, the Roxy is burned to the ground by arson. In the early 70s, the rest of the older movie houses are surviving any way they can. Whittier's Wardman is purchased by the Pussycat Theater chain. Flax Fifth Avenue Theater is now known as the Rowan Heights Theater. It is picketed by citizens for showing X-rated movies and after several court orders, the theater's management thumbs its nose at protesters by permanently painting Deep Throat on its marquee. And sadly, the once heralded star of Puente dims when it too succumbs to the underbelly of society and begins to show adult movies in the late 70s. As the mid to late 80s roll on, the Rowan Theater finally closes. After the 1987 Whittier earthquake, the one-time McNeese, now Whittier Theater, closes due to damage. And the city of West Covina's Capri Theater goes dark in 1988. The 1990s bring us Herculean 18-screen mega cineplexes. And of the 20-some theaters that I've mentioned in this episode from our area, only two are still standing and resemble their former selves. The former Wardman slash Pussycat Theater in Whittier is still in operation. It's now the Whittier Village Cinema and is still an important and vital landmark in the uptown Whittier area. And if you haven't already guessed it by now, the second theater still standing is the Puente Star. Having and keeping the Star Theater in La Puente gives the city an historic and important iconic piece of art and a local treasure, hopefully forever. What happens with a theater is sad. It's kind of like a relative that you don't talk to anymore. After a period of time, you just have no desire to go there or to see it or there's something else newer that you're interested in. And they just kind of, you know, old theaters don't just die. They fade away over a period of time. I, I think they don't realize the value of what they have uh, historically. And I, I think aesthetically and I think morally, there was a different era, people were different then. And <clears throat> today the feeling is, well, they're just old buildings, there's no use for them. Uh, and there's a lot to that, I can't argue with that. But we have to save, I think, at least a representative amount of theaters that show what it used to be like. But I think before we decide on tearing these places down, we should really check into the history of what their, what their position was in history and how they sit in history, whether it means anything or not. If it doesn't, then, you know, I guess that's okay. But 
a lot of these buildings, like we're even having this discussion now, people don't know ever existed. I do know that once she's gone, she's gone forever. And so is a little bit of our simple past. Join us again as we open up the shutter to peek into the stories and the forgotten tales of the Rancho La Puente. Shh. Adios. Tours of the La Puente Heritage Museum are available. Please visit the La Puente Valley Historical Society's website for tour information. Tours of the Whittier Museum in the city of Whittier are available. Please call the Whittier Historical Society or visit their website for tour information. Tours of the Covina Valley Historical Society are available. Please call the Covina Valley Historical Society or visit their website for tour information. Tours of the Historical Society of West Covina are available. Please call the Historical Society of West Covina for tour information. Tours at the El Monte Historical Society Museum are available. Please call the El Monte Historical Society or visit their website for tour information. Getting to the bottom of a story or myth can be an adventure in itself. If you have a mystery you would like to solve, I suggest you find out for yourself. Discover the information you're looking for at your local library today.